Welcome to the Feminist AF podcast, stories of women who are trying to live, work, and love themselves within the patriarchy as it exists today, while simultaneously trying to smash it to pieces for a better tomorrow for all of us. Here, we encourage women to be unapologetically themselves, to take up more space in the world, and to embrace being too much. I'm your host, Jenny Manpa. I'm a licensed clinical therapist, women's leadership coach, and published author. I began my social work career working in juvenile justice, victims advocacy, and community mental health, which highlighted for me how many social issues disproportionately affect women. I found myself trying to do everything and do it perfectly, and all that got me was burned out before I even hit 30. I knew something had to change, so I dug deep into figuring out my own value system, and from there, I founded my own private practice called Forward and Heels, which helps women learn to excel at what they do and stand tall so they can light up the world. Each week, you'll hear from women who are kicking ass, lifting other women up, changing the status quo, prioritizing their mental health, and defining feminism on their own terms. As a quick but important legal disclaimer, this podcast is not therapy. This is for entertainment and discussion purposes only. If you are seeking therapy, please enter into a HIPAA-protected agreement with a licensed therapist for treatment. Thanks for joining me, and now let's get feminist as fuck. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am so excited for you to meet my guest. She is legitimately famous. Dr. Lucy Jones was a seismologist with the U.S. Geological Survey for 33 years. She was stationed at Caltech, and four years ago, she founded the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society to both help scientists interact with policymakers and help policymakers access the science. So basically put all the stuff that we don't really understand into plain English to help us live better lives. Dr. Jones, thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm glad to be here, Jen. So you have also been known as the revered matriarch of seismology, the seismologist next door, the Beyonce of earthquakes, and you are known around the world as the foremost authority on earthquakes, but there was one title that you kind of didn't want me to use of all the ones that I've read online, which was the earthquake lady. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, that term has been around for quite a while here in Southern California. There were two of us that are women and a bunch of men as seismologists responding after earthquakes. And the Kate and I got referred to as the earthquake ladies and the men got referred to as seismologists. And it made me aware that this was really, people couldn't compute the women being scientists. And is it a diminutive, is it a put down, is it an honorific? You could say all sorts of things, but I've never liked the different interpretation between the men and the women. Absolutely. Yeah. Your your fellow male seismologists don't get called like the earthquake guy. Right. Yeah. They get called seismologists. And I'd rather use that term. (laughs) Absolutely. You've certainly earned it. So you have been with the U.S. Geological Survey for 33 years, which means you have been a staple, especially to Californians. You are a face that is well known and around the world. There is a famous story that I would love for you to tell of you holding your baby while reporting on an earthquake. And I have some follow up questions about what that was like and how you've been sort of niched into this woman who has it all in science as a result. (laughs) Okay. yeah. So I I came back to California. I grew up here, went east to college and came back in 1983. And in 1987, we started having a lot of earthquakes. And I discovered that it wasn't just a research science sitting in my corner. It was people demanding information from us, looking for the earthquake ladies, all of this sort of thing. And then my husband is also a seismologist. And in 89, he moved from USC up to Caltech. So that when the earthquake happened, he happens and I needed to respond. So did he. We had two boys. They were born in 86 and, and 90. And in 1992, there was an earthquake at 10 o'clock at night. And actually, I was already at work responding to its foreshock. It was near the San Andreas. And I just chaired a committee to say, how should we respond to earthquakes near the San Andreas and therefore capable of triggering a, a really big earthquake? And I was doing the response to the smaller one when the bigger one happened. He grabbed the kids out of bed, ran into work, and ended up literally handing me the baby in the middle of an interview because there was a computer crisis. And you're crazy if you take little kids into a computer room of 1992. So I'm sort of there, and our five-year-old sort of stood on the side and looked, but the the one-year-old would scream if I put him down because he'd been woken up from a sound sleep. So I did a bunch of interviews. And it was a pivotal moment where the news stories, I mean, they called me Seismo Mom in the newspaper. But there were some interesting articles, too, about 
how comforting it was and that I was comforting the city just like I was comforting the baby. And it did help me realize the role that the scientists play in these crisis situations. The lack of information is frightening. Providing good information is reassuring. And I think it's part of why the women were seen differently than the men in that role, because you feel better when mommy tells you it's okay. And I, it was a very odd experience of really being sort of put in this role of mother to the city. But it's helped me understand what it is that people want out of me since then. That's really interesting. Uh, how do you think that your femininity is an asset in this role when we also know how women often receive less serious attention when they speak about important things, especially being seen, you know, you're holding a baby and that mother sort of schema comes into people's minds. Like, how do you exist in that? I don't even know if it's duality or just layers. I think of it as layers. I mean, I even had somebody tell me that I was like this archetypal Madonna figure in in doing this. And so it was really mixing up the roles. And of course, this is an interesting time, 92. I mean, a bunch of your listeners who weren't born then. And we had started seeing women in more roles. Geraldine Ferraro had already run for vice president. And it was 20 years after really the beginning of the women's movement. And I ended up seeing it as like we'd accepted women working without accepting the consequences of women working. We were there. We weren't, you know, nobody said, don't take my class, you're a waste of time, which women older than me got. But we still hadn't accepted the fact that our private lives still happen and that raising kids takes time and effort. And we, of course, still haven't gotten there, but it, we were farther away from that at the time. And as I said, this, I think that in other roles, it might have done me in because then you can't take mom seriously. But because there was this undercurrent and to most people implicit, not explicitly understood need for comfort, my scientific information somehow was more real (laughs) because of that sort of all the implicit messaging around the mother role. It's been a fascinating thing to sort of try and watch it and analyze it and experience it and all of those things. And what was really noticeable is that colleagues, the male colleagues who literally did as many interviews as I did, wouldn't get remembered and I would. There was one guy who was very good at the public communication and would reg- did easily as much as me. And Jim would laugh about it, that he'd say he worked for the USGS or Caltech, and people were like, oh, do you know Lucy Jones? And you know, and he was literally doing as much as I was. And so you could say that this has helped my career. I became much more visible. The flip side is within the scientific community, because I was popular to the public, I must not be a serious scientist. So there was one time when somebody told me I shouldn't ask so-and-so to write a letter of recommendation for me again, because he put me down as being just a public figure. So it wasn't general, but that definitely there were a few guys for whom that became an issue. And it could be turned on you. There was one situation. So, so because of this, I was a lot more visible and the culture within the scientific community is you're not supposed to want this. This is clearly a sign that you're not being taken seriously. If the public can understand what you're saying, it must not be that important. That's an implicit sort of thing within the scientific community. So you definitely don't encourage this type of stuff to go on. But of course, most people like being quoted in the paper and being listened to. So there's a bit of jealousy mixed into all of this. So it's this pretty weird thing within the community. Well, and mostly you try to avoid it. Yeah, it's interesting because you mentioned Geraldine Ferraro. And as we record this, Kamala Harris has just been elected vice president. And I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be the first or the only, you know, you're the only visible woman doing X. And the criticism of her when she was chosen as Joe Biden's running mate was she's too ambitious. And it's like, don't you have to be a little bit crazy to want to be president or vice president or be that public figure and have the accountability of everything rest on you? Like you have to be ambitious enough and you have to have an ego that is backed by facts and history and experience to believe that you can do this job better than the alternatives. So you have to be a little bit wanting it too much. Right. And and especially in politics and especially with that really crazy job of president, vice president, and the competition 
It's inherently part of politics. Somebody always loses every time somebody wins. In science, you've got a lot of the same competition. Just it isn't so obvious who the loser is. But much of the way academic science is done is about getting as many publications as you can and getting your papers cited by other papers and getting the awards. And it's a very individually centered competition for acknowledgement and achievement. And with time, I've been able to go, that's a rather masculine, (laughs) it's a traditionally masculine view. And one of the things that's really motivated me is how do we get the science used? I mean, I started studying earthquake prediction in the mid 70s. It looked like the Chinese maybe had predicted an earthquake and it was the guy was going to save the world or at least the part of it silly enough to live on the San Andreas Fault. In the long run, we ended up discovering that, of course, earthquakes really are fundamentally not predictable. And so my research ended up shifting from working on foreshocks and how to try and make short-term warnings to impacts and what we call disaster scenarios, how to make it clear what the likely outcome of an earthquake is so that we can prepare for it at whatever time it actually happens. But I've been thinking of it in terms of how do you get the science used? And that one of the things is where people just don't listen unless you've got that immediate thing of the earthquake. They all turn to us right after it happens, but just before it happens, who wants to bother with this? We've got a lot of other demands. And it's true. I mean, things cost money and you could be using your money for other social goods. And one of the things that happened to me along the way is I was making this shift. I got uh, offered the opportunity to well, make a proposal for a pilot project on how to integrate science, disaster hazards research. And we created this proposal for a multi-hazards demonstration project. This is all within the, the government to demonstrate how hazard science can improve a community's resilience to natural disasters. And that's a whole long political story of how it came about, but it, I ended up getting funded in the first year and they asked me to lead this project. And Going to do it, there were two things that happened. One is to do that, I was essentially walking away from the more direct research career, the things that get you those awards within the science community, to instead be scientific leadership, getting other people to do good work, getting them funding, getting the opportunities, and in this case, getting the connection between society and the science. I made this decision essentially to walk away from the competition Uh, In the long run, the very funny part about it is I ended up getting all those awards and fellowships, most of them, except for the promotion within the U.S. Geological Survey. So everywhere but my own agency saw this as really valuable. And within the agency, they thought it was really important. They just didn't think it was the same as research science. It didn't have the same value. But the other aspect of it is if I wanted the science used, I had to get people to listen to me. And I already had this high level of visibility, especially after the incident with the baby and various other earthquakes, and people all remembered me from various earthquakes. And while I had been actively trying to pretend that none of that public recognition was there because that's not what you do as a scientist, in this situation then, I said, okay, I can ask for interviews. I can go and try and get it out so that people will listen to the results of these science studies that we're doing. So I explicitly made a choice to make use of the visibility to further the aims of the project. And what I didn't count on was the degree to which celebrity feeds on itself. So that by going out there and doing more interviews to promote the shakeout, if you've, I don't know, the great shakeout and the shakeout scenario and this big sort of effort to get policy affected here in California, And because of the shakeout, I then became that much more visible, which became that much more accessible or have much greater access to the policymakers, where it ended up that the mayor of Los Angeles asked me to work with him to develop a project. And I spent a year at City Hall developing seismic policies, which got me even more visible. And that whole feedback loop was like, oh, (laughs) and if I hadn't undertaken this project and I hadn't walked away from the scientific norm that you try to ignore or pretend that you don't like the public part, none of that would have happened. And we would, a lot of these seismic policies wouldn't have been enacted. So I don't, I, I see the goal, but now I'm sort of got enough of a celebrity level, people recognizing me 
that it has affected my ability to be seen as, well, it doesn't, some people then think I'm even more important a scientist and some people think I'm less. It's a very confounding aspect in your, you know, attribute to have within the scientific community. Yeah. You have talked about how when we let scientists start making policy, we invite politicians to start making science. How do you sort of, you know, you have this time at City Hall, your whole goal of the Dr. Lucy Jones Center is to make science accessible to the normal person. What does it mean for you to be making policy alongside policy makers and really giving the normal people, the everyday people who aren't going to pay attention until the earthquake happens, what information do they need to have to understand? And how does it impact their psyche, let's say, to have just a little bit of warning or a little bit of knowledge or information? When do you cross the line of like scaring people or it's too much or they can't handle it? And where do you like, what are, I guess maybe what are the five things people would need to know in order to be safe in their own lives? Oh, Jenny, you've just basically come up with all the conundrums of the last decade of my career. Okay, good. So it's not just me that I couldn't even form the question. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, no, no. There's a whole bunch of complicated layers. Let's start with the first thing of when you, you know, scientists make policy, you invite the politicians to make science, which we've seen with the climate change debate, right? And there's a few layers of issues in here. And to me, you know, all of them come out of this sort of the isolation of the scientific research process from the rest of this of society. We sit in our academic powers and compete with each other for citations and journals. And it's somebody else's job to get the science used. And we don't treat science as something that everybody needs to understand to some extent. We accept that, you know, high level universities will graduate very smart people with no science at all or no math at all. And we see science as something for the specialist. Right there is a core problem for a whole lot of things in society. This is going to sound weird, but compounded by the internet. There was a time when reading was something only specialists did. But once we had the printing press, it became something that everybody needed to be able to do to function in society. You still had specialists that were professional writers, but everybody needed to be able to read and write. The internet is a similarly disruptive technology that has put all information in our laps, true and false information. And essentially what research science is, is figuring out what is actually true. And it's a series of skills to recognize confirmation bias, to recognize the ways we fool ourselves, peer review, putting your results out to somebody else and asking them to tear it apart is a core function in science, you, you the easiest person to fool is yourself. And so that idea that you could, everything you think is true might turn out to be wrong, and you need to compare it to the data at all times. And so that a scientist looking at some random web page is taking in a lot of information about whether or not this is reliable or whether or not to just be skeptical about it. And those sort of skills are now something that everybody needs to function in this deluge of information that's happening in the real world. And we aren't teaching those skills. When we teach science in earlier education, it's a bunch of facts that you're supposed to memorize instead of a process by which you understand what really is worth looking at. And I think that's a huge, huge problem. So that said, now let's talk about those policy aspects of it this is where I can go to and sit down with a policymaker and say, here's what this earthquake's going to do to you. And I could just be a good science communicator, make sure they understood, stand with this and walk away. But when they're going to try and make policy, they've got to say, well, okay, if these buildings are really bad, but we can't afford to get rid of them all, how about if we just mandate this type of fix? Is it going to be enough and how much difference will it make? And is it enough to make it worth the money? And that's where my role was to sit down with them and go, well, that looks like a good idea to you, but that actually doesn't fix the core problem. That You'd still have your core vulnerability there. Uh, whereas if you took this other approach, there you're going to solve more. It's a more cost-effective thing to do. So you're, the process of finding solutions 
is understanding the science well enough to understand the implications of the decisions, but then also taking in these other political and social facts that affect our ability to actually get it done. And if you just hand off the science, when compromises need to be made, you're not ready to be there. And so what I've started to talk about is a process that I call science activation, how to work with the policymakers to do it. But Remembering that it is not the job of the scientists to come up with salute to, to make the decisions. Our job is to make sure the policymaker who has been elected to make those decisions understands the implications of their decisions. And it's hard to keep that balance because I'm also a citizen. I look at this and I can, you know, sort of comprehend everything that's going on. And I think that this policy is a really good idea. And that's integrating both my science information and my political leanings. And if I just give that answer, I'm incorporating my politics, the political leanings, and it makes it much easier for someone else to reject it. Whereas if you've got this engagement, you know, one, we've got to be like really clear. No, climate change is not natural, period. Absolute. We can prove it. Right. And even if there's a natural component, uh, you add more carbon, you're thickening the blanket on this earth, you're making it worse, period. That's a fact. That's a scientific fact. How we choose to go about reducing carbon, whether it should be a carbon tax process or whether it's an investment in solar energy or whatever it is, those we can tell you how much difference that will make in advancing the warming of the earth. But it's more than just the science, whether or not, which is the, the, the most likely to be successful approach to doing it. And so we can't sit in our tower. And then we have the problem that the competitive process that gets you tenure in your academic institution doesn't value this type of work. And so you've pretty much, we've seen people get into this just because they believe in it so deeply that they're willing to sacrifice some of their career to do it. And we can't afford as a society to still be forcing people to make those sort of choices. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned before you kind of alluded to women coming before you in both STEM and in other career fields being asked, why should you take this seat from someone else? I think is something that we've heard like Ruth Bader Ginsburg in law school, 10 women in her class had to stand up and say like, why do you deserve to be here when you're taking a seat from a man? So I'm curious, it's hard enough getting girls into STEM right now in 2020, and then to stay in that in STEM, how did you over 30 years ago, what was your trajectory that was it school? Was it someone in your life? Like, how did you get and stay in STEM as sometimes the only one? Absolutely. My father, if it hadn't been for my father, I wouldn't have been there. My father was an aerospace engineer and was a you know man of the 50s and 60s. And I remember at one point hearing him say, quite admirably talking about the only woman engineer in his workplace and saying, Jenny doesn't think like a woman. She thinks like an engineer. And I'm like, dad, what does a woman think like? And he he was like, oh yeah, women can't do math. And I I think I looked strict and I was like, I was like, but you're my daughter. (laughs) You can do it. And so it wasn't like he, he wasn't a man of his own time. It was just that he, he had different expectations for me. And that sort of gave me confidence to stick with it. I'm an interesting age. I was born in 1955. So my elementary and early high school years are completely in this misogynistic, or in this time in which women don't do math. When I had a aptitude test, and we used to have these guidance classes to help you figure out what your future was. And they gave us math and science aptitude test. And I got a perfect score on it. And the teacher then accused me of cheating because women didn't get, girls didn't get scores like that. And she made me retake it in front of her. So that's sort of my early education. And so by the time I got to college, women were already out of this. They'd been talked out of taking the math classes. The high level math classes were pretty much all guys by the time you stuck with it through into calculus. So But that's also when the women's movement was really getting going. So by the time I got to college in 1972, this thing of like, I won't let you be in my class because women don't do this 
wasn't happening, but I was still pretty much the only woman in most of my classes. <laughs> By the second year as a physics major, I was the only woman as a physics major. This wonderful old professor, he was close to retirement at the time, used to come in each day and look over the class and go, ah, good afternoon, lady and gentlemen, and chuckle a little bit. And he did it every day for the whole semester. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that joke gets old. <laughs> Yeah, it got old pretty quickly, but it was, I could also see, I mean, he was a, that sort of old school gentleman, so I, I didn't call him out on it. So it, I'm at this weird time where I was the only one, but just behind me were the girls who weren't talked out of math in high school because the teachers had figured out they better stop saying this, at least quite so obviously. So when I went in, at, uh, when I was accepted at MIT as a graduate student in 1976, there were no women in the geophysics program. And there was one woman that, that was accepted in the class with me who was at Woods Hole doing oceanography. But by my third year, so two years behind me, the incoming class was a third woman. And so that's what I mean. I'm really at that, at that cusp between when one level changed. So back then, we successfully changed this thing of talking good people who really got it out of it, right? Nobody was accused of cheating or a few years after me, they probably weren't accused of cheating when they got a good score on math aptitude. But you then get into the process, you know, then we still had stuff, you know, the various types of sexual harassment or the sort of belittling things that can be going on. I think of a couple of things that happened to me in graduate school. One was the, I was working in a, a laboratory called rock mechanics. We were literally you know, putting rocks under high pressure and doing various things to them to study the the properties. And there is a, a English guy who was the technician in the lab who ran all the machines and got started giving me a hard time and sort of getting a little handsy, as we used to say. But one thing I had the courage to go to my professor and tell him what was happening. And the professor believed me and told Jacques to cut it out. And it was okay. So I was fortunate in that I, you know, on both of those things, <laughs> especially the response of the professor. And then there's the other professor that I was primarily doing my thesis work with was, I wrote a paper, very, crit he, you know, had a lot of criticisms, all of this stuff. And I finally went to him, I think in my third year, and I just said, it's clear that you don't think I'm very good. You don't like what I'm doing. And this other professor in the rock mechanics lab wants me to work with him. Why don't I just shift and leave and go work with this other guy? And this professor looked at me and goes, what are you talking about? You're the best student I've got. Which I broke into tears. And it was like, uh. but again, we were able to talk about it. And he didn't realize to what degree his criticisms were taking me down. And so I think that one of the things that got me through there is I was willing to speak up for myself. Now, we shouldn't all need to do that. And I will say, I know plenty of men who dropped out of graduate school because they couldn't speak up for themselves. And it's interesting just now, and sort of it's coming out of Black Lives Matter and the sort of social awareness this summer. There is much more discussion in the academic community of the way in which thesis advisors destroy their students. You know, and now it's being brought up, you know, what's happening with women and people of color that can't, that don't have role models, and then they get put down, they feel like they don't belong here. And I guess I would just say, as I said, I've seen plenty of white men fail out of the same thing. And it's a cultural issue of this competition rather than collaboration and support. And hopefully that's going to shift now. It's, it's a long, long process to change those sort of cultural issues. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like even as someone, I have multiple graduate degrees, but not nearly in such a you know rigorous science of PhD and the seismology that you've studied. But there is a bit of an idea that like, only the strong survive. And so even in quote unquote soft sciences, which is what I do or social sciences, there is an idea that it's not about support and care so much as pushing you to be better, be better, be better. And I do think that there is a slow institutional change in, oh, right, you're also a human. You also do need to be praised sometimes. You do need to be validated. But where is that backlash kind of swing in the other direction of coddling? So I do think academic institutions are, they're cruise ships, not 
speedboats and they're certainly right. going to take their time. <laughs> right. I've been impressed with the discussions this summer for the first time. There isn't so much. This is coddling. It's interesting. I have, uh, there's a you know, harassment training that happens in various institutions. I took it back when I was in the government. Now that I'm an adjunct at Caltech without the government connection, now they're saying I need to take the Caltech one. And so I, I had a variety of exposures to these. I'm actually really impressed at what they found in terms of being able to take it to clueless guys who aren't doing this intentionally, <laughs> but don't see the impact. And where they're actually like taking them through, imagine if you'd said this instead of that, look at how that might play out. And not to dismiss how hurtful some of this is and how destructive it can be, but there is a really large part of cluelessness that's part of it. Yeah. I had to laugh. I took a similar training not too long ago for New York State for the same purposes. And it said, and I think they actually did a good job in that it was a very logical and realistic. It wasn't sort of the old school sexual harassment trainings we see that are so over the top and overdone that you're like, that doesn't happen. It's not like that. But this one, it was clearly responsive. And so one of the slides was like, a male manager is afraid to be alone with a female subordinate because he might be accused of sexual harassment. And on the next slide, it was like, don't sexually harass your subordinates and you won't be accused of it. And it was just, it made me laugh because it was like, no, we're not going to play these mental gymnastics of like, oh, but no, just don't harass people and we'll be fine. And I had to laugh. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And so it's a slow, slow process. And the more you have around, you can do this. But I would also say we are now getting lots more women through the pipeline, getting their PhDs. I remember then in the eighties when I was sort of early in, in my professional career, I got my PhD in 81. And at one point being asked about an institution and really, you know, it's like they started recognizing they were graduating their women, but none of the women stayed in the field. And it was a place where the competition was relatively ugly and the, the sort of like, well, yes, we accepted you, but let's see if you're really up to snuff. And they saw the PhD process as how to winnow out the true diamonds in the rough and get rid of the rest. And there were women who graduated successfully and then went, yes, but this is not the sort of human being I want to be. And going off into other fields or other occupations or stay home with the kid. And I think that that's another aspect within especially academic science is that the nastiness of the competition can just be, I don't want to be this. And then you have, when you have to show up with the kid and responding to the earthquake, just the demands of being a mother and a full-time career. My boys are now 30 and 34, so I'm out the other end. But raising children is a full-time job. And if out, falls primarily on the woman, she's now got two jobs she's trying to do. I survived it because my husband got it and we had two people sharing three jobs, which is more manageable than one person how in two. And it was the only way we could have gotten through. And that's where I really feel back to the beginning of this conversation that we've accepted women working without accepting the consequences of women working. And when you push the children to the side or get to them after work, they hurt for it. I, without question, feel that I didn't give my children enough time and I didn't give my work enough time. I did spend 10 years working part-time. Our older one turned out to have learning disabilities when he started into elementary school and it was really a challenge. And actually, and my mother had just died, so he was dealing with that loss. I was too. We, uh, I went to part time so that he didn't have to be ever go to after school care. And it was critical. I'm really glad that I could do that. I only got to do it because I had an understanding boss. And that's where one of the problems is. I actually filed leave without pay every pay period for 10 years. Because if I had gone to a part time job, we would never have been able to get it back. And I think I only had the courage to do it because there had been, there was a woman a couple of years older than me in the USGS in another office who had gone half time and still ended up in the National Academy of Sciences. 
So it was like, okay. <laughs> and, and, and her example helped my bosses go, okay, this is something worth doing. And even so, it was our best compromise, but there's no question it was a compromise. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I'm hearing you say over and over again is that you may not have been able to do any of these things, whether it was go to a professor and tell them that you were being harassed or have a job be this flexible, if there weren't one person who said, okay, I maybe it hasn't been done before, or maybe one person's done it, so I've seen a model for you, I'll let you, quote unquote, I'll give you permission, which I think is part of the problem is that A, we don't see someone ahead of us being allowed to be flexible in this way, and then B, it takes, you have to get the right person with the right understanding and the right willingness to sort of take a chance on you, and that's not how our system should be set up. Exactly. And people took a chance on me because I was I was a superstar. I mean, by comparison, right? And I think there was a, a woman professor at Brown when I was an undergraduate who said this to me. The system is such that if you are really at the top, you make it through. But what about all of the, the pretty good women? They're the ones who don't make it through. The pretty good guys do. And we need a system that doesn't see it that way. And part of that is laws. Part of it is cultural norms. I mean, one thing the last four years should have taught us is how much norms matter in things functioning. And the norm is that you completely dedicate yourself to your job. So I had boys, not girls. My son's first child is due to be born any day now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and he's in a PhD program and they're going to work it out for the first few months because my daughter-in-law lost her job with the pandemic. And they went, okay, well, I guess this is working out for now, but it's, he wants to spend the time. He wants to be able to really be engaged with his child. And he luckily has his advisor as a woman who raised her kids and really gets it and has been really supportive of him doing that. Even when I carried that child on TV and everybody said, oh, look, at you have it all. I was recognizing that if my husband had done the same thing I did and carried a child while doing interviews, he would have been torn apart. And I was saying back then, if we ever reach the time when the men can be on TV carrying the child doing their job and it's, oh, what a beautiful picture then we'll really have gotten somewhere. And I feel like we're just barely now getting there. That my son can talk about really taking some time off his PhD program to be with his child and his advisor saying, great. You're starting to see people do it, guys do interviews holding their kids. And I think that that's one of the more encouraging signs that I've seen. Yeah. A lot of terrible things have come our way via the pandemic, but I do think given that everyone has to work from home, there have been a lot more men on TV, whether they are doing a talking head for like a CNN or I, there's a weather guy that I follow who's, you know, children and pets and just the, the markers of their lives come on screen in a way that they were very compartmentalized before. And we're starting to normalize that everyone has obligations outside of work. Being a superstar should not mean that you do all work and nothing else. And that's the only way you get ahead. Right. And it was a model that worked when women stayed home. And that's where, when we stopped saying women stay home, we didn't change the model and we got to get there. (laughs) Yeah. I'm really curious, you know, you've talked about the timeline and the trajectory of where you were in your personal career as the world at large changed around you. And that even just a difference of a couple of years of your academic classes, saw more women, how did you, how did your evolution of feminism tie in with both the times that you were going through and then the areas you were in? And I'm asking this because there's a story that I'm dying for you to tell about a summer studying earthquakes in Afghanistan, where someone tried to buy you from your professor. How has this kind of experience really just both seemed very normal and also shaken you? And would it have felt different 10 years prior, 10 years later? Like, tell me everything about your journey to feminism. I would say my journey to feminism, sure, it was a journey. I mean, I would say I started there. My mother was a very strong woman. Her mother was a very strong woman who became assistant superintendent of education. She was in the second graduating class at UCLA. And during World War II, was assistant superintendent of education. My mother then 
basically having been ignored by her mother, said, I'm not going to do that. And she stayed home to really take care of her kids and give her kids what her mother hadn't given her. But it was out of a strong place. It was never, you guys should stay home. And it was also, uh, there was a certain amount for me that was like, when you have a really strong woman who's only place for uh, her energies are her children. It's a little overwhelming sometimes. And I was like, I'm not going to do that to my kids. We swing back and forth. But between my parents, I never felt being told what I was going to do. I was, I always felt encouraged to develop what I had. So in that sense, it was really good. The one thing I would say is greater social awareness. My family has a lot of streaks of the autistic spectrum through us in a variety of ways. And I could tend to not notice what goes on (laughs) around me sometimes. And so I had this confidence for my family and sort of ignored what the rest of the world said. And I think I was also, I wore glasses. I was pudgy. I was never going to be accepted. So I might as well damn well be the smartest one there. (laughs) They weren't going to like me anyway. I could stick it to them on this. And so I sort of came from a place of confidence that was perhaps somewhat rare. The evolution has been being more aware of the women around me and the society around me and seeing more of those, that larger impact. Because that whole thing of being able to see role models or whatever, since it didn't matter to me, I, I wasn't doing this because of who I saw around me. I, I sort of had that internal confidence, but that was, as I said, it was partly just sort of introversion and the rest of the world didn't really matter but as I grew up in time and raising children and and you start being much more aware of the larger community at the same time we've got this whole path that society's taken so in 1976 I got accepted to MIT and they were trying to convince me to go there and and not Caltech and they said they'd do whatever they could to send me to China because I had been studying Chinese and then the guy who I ended up working with offered to take me with him for field work in Afghanistan. Another graduate student was doing his thesis there. We were putting out, physically putting out seismographs around the mountains of of the Hindu Kush and you need bodies that know how to operate a seismograph. So I went and it was a joint project with French. So there were one French professor and two French students and one American professor and two American students. And there was a French mission in, in Kabul at the time for geology. And so we arrived in Kabul and the the French geologist that ran the mission in Kabul comes to meet us. We get off the plane. He looks at me, turns to my professor and went, what the hell did you bring her for? And I was like, oh, why? Why? Excuse me. (laughs) And but he was like, oh, my God, do you realize the problems here? How are we going to keep her safe? How are we going to keep her from being stolen? And it was like, oh, (laughs) and the big debate, would I wear a tadri, a, a burqa, or try to pretend to be a boy? And because the alternative wasn't safe. And I basically dressed like a boy. I had really short hair at the time. And it was interesting that people see what they expect to see. As long as I kept my mouth shut, everyone assumed I was a boy. And just by wearing loose clothes. And yeah, so it was like, oh, Lord. And it was a fascinating scientific experience but it was also this astonishing social experience. And there was one village that we went to where male visitors would come to the site because there was a shrine nearby. And there was this one family with a patriarch and his sons and and children that had this village that maintained the shrine. And we got it. We put a seismograph up there. We would go in every couple of days and they invited me to go into the women's part of the village, but the translator couldn't go with us. (laughs) And actually, there was a woman seismologist, a professor there with us in that time period. And she and I went and met with these women. We couldn't, we had no language to share. We could just sort of, we did things by gesturing and trying to get around ideas. And it came out, this, the matriarch, we were the first people outside her family that she'd seen in 50 years. Because women didn't travel to these shrines and they never left the mountain. Yeah, it was this whole, and it was that family that offered to buy me. They did offer to buy me. I think it was like a, to, to be a compliment. <laughs> they did offer double the going rate, two camels <laughs> instead of one. Oh my God. Yeah. So and that was my introduction to seismology is this two months in Afghanistan in this whole, I mean, it felt like 
not that different from it would have been 2000 years ago. I mean, uh, there was a lot, they, they had trucks beyond the existence of automobiles. The, much of this life was as it has always been. And that was, so, so that was my introduction. That was just before I started into graduate school. They made me never want to go back to the Mideast. I mean, it was really clear that to a lot of these people, I was property and that my professor would have had the right to sell me. And that also gave me a standard. I could go, okay, things may be bad, but it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Context. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, um, gosh. Well, I have one more question if you have a couple of minutes. I know we're right at time. Sure. Okay. So you wrote a book called The Big Ones about how we make meaning out of natural disasters. And I'm curious, I always like to look at sort of the macro down to the micro. Do you see patterns in the way we explain natural disasters? Like you talk about in your book, like God was punishing us or other sort of the ways in which we make meaning. And do you see parallels in the ways we blame survivors of assault? Absolutely. Because, I mean, what I ended up developing with the book, and it was interesting, it was the process of writing the book that helped me really see this is that humans make patterns. That's what allowed us to succeed evolutionarily, right? We didn't have as big teeth or strong muscles as our competitors, but we had brains to make patterns. And so especially when we're facing danger, we use our brains to make a pattern that tells us how to be safe. The problem is it doesn't have to be the right pattern. <laughs> we make them up even when they don't exist. So when something is really, truly random, like the timing of an earthquake, we can't accept that. We try to find the pattern. And Western society has long had a tradition that God is punishing us through earthquakes because it was a way of making sense of that. Eastern culture blames a, an imbalance of the yin and yang forces for earthquakes. The yin earth is overpowering the yang sky. So it's caused by having women in government, for instance. But uh, <laughs> all of these are attempts to make a pattern that lets us figure out how to be safe. Because if God's punishing us for our sins, I can protect myself by not making those same bad choices, by being a good person. Right? And we've mostly moved beyond that interpretation. So there's still some people who hold on to it. But we still try to find a reason for, for everything. And if we blame the victim, we can then keep ourselves safe by not making their bad choices. And maybe it's not they're sinning, but now it's th think about it for everything. So when, when you saw Katrina hit, we looked at that and said, why were those people so stupid as to not evacuate? And ignoring the fact that the evacuation plans weren't there. They said, use your own private car. And there were 100,000 people who didn't have their own cars in New Orleans. And we do it when you hear somebody has cancer. What's your first thought? Did he smoke? Right? You hear somebody had a heart attack. Well, you know, she was really having trouble with her weight, wasn't she? And all of those are ways of thinking it won't happen to me. And we, historically, sexual assault is this random thing that hits women and you you have the feeling that you can't protect yourself from all of the possible ways it could happen so but if you can say that woman got raped because she was wearing you know the wrong clothes because she went into the wrong location she should have controlled it that's if you believe that she could have controlled it you believe that you can control it and it won't happen to you and i think it's a core human approach because it makes us feel safer but our you know emotions might allow us to feel safer without actually being safer yeah so given that what do we know about earthquakes and the ways in which we can since they're unpredictable what else do we need to know do we is it about having the right uh, infrastructure in our homes is it a right ha about having an emergency bag what can we do if we can't control when they hit we, we can't control when they hit, but we can control our environment. Almost all the damage is preventable if you choose to do it. Now, there are some things that are not worthwhile. I'm not going to make it really difficult to get my dishes out every day to make sure they don't fall over uh, and get smashed in an earthquake because I can afford to replace my dishes if it comes to that. But if, you, if you're buying a house, First thing we do is get a foundation specialist in to come in and look at it and see what it needs to be done to make it be safer. If it's in too bad shape, that's a house I won't buy. 
we've never spent more than $1,500 fixing up a house that way. If you're renting, you just ask the landlord before you rent, what have you done about seismic safety? Is this retrofitted? You can also find information from your building department. And most of the ways in which buildings get damaged enough to kill people haven't been allowed for decades and they can be retrofitted. And you just, you take that as one of your choices when you're doing it. And then a lot of damage and even injury comes from things being thrown around. So we don't put glass framed pictures in our hallway to make sure this was, especially when the kids were younger, we wanted to make sure that they could get from their bedroom to our bedroom without walking through glass. We never put a bed under a window. Or if we have to do that, we make sure the window's been filmed so broken glass won't come down on the bed. You spend a third of your life in bed. <laughs> it means a third of the earthquakes are happening when you're in bed. It's the awareness that the earthquake's inevitable. What Look around where you are. My bookcases are all bolted into the wall. And I never put a bookcase that could fall on a bed. So it's, and that aspect actually reduces a lot of the losses, makes you a lot safer, and it gives, it empowers you. It makes you feel in control of the environment. I wrote a book actually after the Northridge earthquake, a book called Putting Down Roots in Earthquake Country. It's continued out there. It's still being put out it's online. And part of it is having a hazard hunt, how to go through your house and look for things that you could make safer. And if you have children involve them in the process so they don't feel as scared about the earthquake because they know you've done something about it. I love that reframing of making it a hunt, a game, not a scary thing. You have to wait for it to happen to you and it's going to be a disaster. Yeah, right. Take control of your environment. You can't control the earthquake. You can't control your environment and make it so the earthquakes don't hurt you. I mean, great advice for life, right? We can't control well, yes, so much right. of it. We can control our environment <laughs> as best we can. So actually, you can point. <laughs> <laughs> I always love to end, especially when we talk about heavy topics, which is always with me. I always like to end on what I call champagne wins. And these are the things that are, what are you toasting to? What's a good thing that happened in your life recently? Maybe not so recently, but it's lingering and making you feel really good. What's a thing you want to toast to as we wrap up? Yeah, there's not a lot good in the last year. <laughs> um you know, I said I walked away from the academic competition to try and get the science used, which was sort of a feminization of the science. My goal was protecting people rather than getting myself more publication. The funny thing was, when I actually did it that way, I got lots of awards. I ended up being co author on 40 papers in five years because. It turns out that when you try to get the science used, there's a lot of little corners and a lot of extra science that needed to be done. Then became the opportunity to work in LA City Hall and the awareness that science, I, I mean, I think I inspired people to say you can be a scientist and help society. And one of the things I got out of that was something called the Service to America Medal, which I think is probably the thing I'm proudest of. It's given only to eight federal employees each year. Anthony Fauci just got it this year. So I thought, yes, very, very good company. And I got it for helping make LA safe from earthquakes. We still have a long ways to go, but there's a recognition that that, that type of work matters. And I feel pretty happy about seeing that through. Absolutely. And I think on the receiving end of you just making information accessible to those of us who aren't science and math minded, you have the podcast getting through it, really just teaching people how the world works and what people tend to feel during natural disasters. It destigmatizes and demystifies it in a certain way. And bad things are going to happen to us. And so I think it's certainly worth toasting that any one person can feel a little bit less scared with a little bit more preparation that you're making accessible information to people about things that are really scary. Thank you. I Yeah. Getting through it literally came out of the pandemic. I couldn't give public talks. What are we going to do? And it's turned out to be a lot more fun making a podcast than I imagined it would be. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lucy Jones, thank you so much for being here. We will link to everywhere that people can find you in the show notes. And I'm so excited to follow all of your work. Thank you very much, Jenny. It's been a great talk with you. <laughs>
Thank you so much for joining us today and getting feminist as fuck. And if you're enjoying what you're hearing, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so that others can discover our community as well. 